uh, very pleased to, to introduce uh, Professor uh, Gabor Chani uh, today for the CCSE seminar. Um, and Gabor has been visiting uh, for the uh, past couple of days already, and it's, it's been fantastic. Uh, so uh, Gabor is a professor of molecular modeling at uh, the University of Cambridge and does a lot of work that he's going to talk to us about today in terms of algorithms and data-driven numerical methods for atomistic scale problems um, whole, across a whole range of uh, different applications. Um, he's no stranger to MIT, got his PhD uh, from MIT in 2001. Uh, prior to that, an undergrad degree in mathematics uh, at the University of Cambridge, and uh, then sort of uh, you know went back to Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge and has been there uh, ever since and really pioneered a lot of uh, methods for you know machine learning and data-driven methods in molecular modeling and applications and materials and other kinds of chemistry and uh, yeah really glad that you could give a summer and please take it away. Thank you very much Yusuf. It's a huge pleasure to be back. Um, I was over at building 12 uh, for six years. I've never been to this building. In fact it's great now I know what RLE is. I was telling you, so I, I had an early mug, but I didn't know, uh, I, 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 yeah, I didn't know where it really came from. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll tell you about uh, really what happened over the last 10 years uh, to, uh, to this field of atomistic modeling, to, um, to uh, molecular modeling, which is my field, and it has changed completely. Uh, and uh, that's the, I want to illustrate that. Uh, I will focus on molecular dynamics and mostly materials. Of course, there are other, uh, th there are also molecular systems which are very interesting, but I have done a bit less work and I'm, uh, I, I wanted to share with you some of the details and that's I'm most familiar with, um, with the materials aspect. And, and there are other things than molecular dynamics um, in materials modeling, but again, we can't fit everything into an hour. So I'd, I've chosen to go more, more in the detail and less, um, uh, less in the overview. Oh, over here. Okay. So I would like to introduce uh, the talk by just making you think about the multiple scales of, of modeling. And particularly if you're thinking about doing uh, molecular dynamics, then um, we, can, we actually know how the world works. So down, down here, um, if as long as you don't have too many atoms, by too many, I really mean two, um, or if they are um, on the first row, then maybe four, um, then we can actually solve the Schrodinger equation. And we, we you know what it is, and it's uh, it's a, the approximations that that we make when we write that down are um, really very very well controlled. So as long as there are no nuclear processes, the atoms don't change their um, uh, their position in the periodic table, then uh, the Schrodinger equation for the electrons and the nuclei are, are more or less true, and so we can solve them. And that's a very so I just want you know take five seconds to contemplate that that this is not you're not observing the world and trying to figure out what's going on. We actually know how the world works. Um, the, the the reason uh, we just don't end up you know the, the talk doesn't end here um, is because these equations are incredibly expensive. So we can do you know I said ten atoms maybe this would be generous. Uh, no time uh, evolution really, uh, and and that's where the the errors that we make. Um, I put it the accuracy, but really the error that you make, let's say that that is zero. Uh, but if you want, if you're interested in, in more atoms or dynamical processes, then uh, these equations are too complicated to solve. And what I've illustrated here um, by these different pictures and names is a whole hierarchy of uh, methods, uh, various treatments of simplifications, uh, coarse graining, um, and all kinds of bastardization of the original Schrodinger equation, which helps us um, sort of move along this axis of capability. Uh, these, you can see this is a log scale. And uh, I, I only update these numbers sort of every 20 years. Uh, these things don't change uh, that, that much. Um, and, and really, if, once you are into linear scaling methods, then really the product of which not all of them are. So the things here scale very badly with number of atoms. But here is the product of time and the number of atoms that, that is roughly uh, your capability. But uh, the, the y-axis is sort of more interesting. So I've put numbers here, which are um, again, some sort of, that's, that's the wisdom that you get from your advisor on what is uh, the typical accuracy uh, of a method, sort of in general. Of course, uh, in any specific system that can vary, but I've only really been able to put numbers uh, up to the sort of first, um, uh, first four, up, up to really this empirical quantum uh, uh, method. Because beyond that, when you try to treat millions of atoms, 
uh, or billions of atoms and, and microseconds or more, then accuracy stops becoming a quant quantitative thing. Really, there are things that are these, these, these high level models just dramatically get wrong um, and, and it's not useful to characterize them uh, with a number. So how do we make these models? So typically, um, and this is, goes for actually all of science, you have some, um, some, some theory, some high level theory up here, uh, and, uh, and you want to say, okay, this is how things work, should work. That's what I make based on my, that's what I think based on my observations. And then you go to some lower level, you simulate the constituents of your theory and see if what you get back uh, matches uh, with your observations. You test your, your theory by simulation. Uh, and, and so we go back and forth, uh, round and round that loop. And you can do this at every level. So if you have a, some theory about how uh, these coarse grain molecules work. Maybe it's an atomistic theory, of how the atoms that are in those molecules give rise to those high level interactions. What I have here is a, is a piece of a cell wall and you want to ask, why does it form? If you stick the constituent molecules into, into water, uh, you have a theory that on the lower level, and again, you test it. And this three goes all the way down uh, to the bottom. But there's an alternative. And that's uh, where I, that's, that's the, the research uh, that I, the, the approach of the research that, that I made. And, and I want to commit to you that this is really interesting, which is where you start from the bottom and you say, I know the Schrodinger equation is true, but let me get the consequences of that much higher up. So how can I, and this, I call this first principles modeling. And this used to be the meaning, but if you look at the literature um, now, first principles modeling actually means something else. It means all these methods up to this bar, basically. All the methods which treat the electrons explicitly. That's where in that world of solving the Schrodinger equation at various levels of approximation for the electrons is what people call first principles modeling. But the idea that we go from below is very general. Now, the reason in the current literature, this is what is the synonym, first principle modeling is a synonym for electronic structure calculation is because that's where this idea of taking something from below and deriving systematically the consequences has been successful. And going beyond electronic structure and asking where do atoms move and larger molecules and what do they do without reference to the electrons, people have not been able to do, derive that systematically. So that's why I'm, what I'm trying to do is reclaim this word First principles modeling isn't just electronic structure theory. It's not just density functional theory, but really it's this whole idea of going from below and I want to extend it. And the reason I want to extend it, yeah. So it extends, it, it, it separates these electronic methods from atomic and molecular and higher level. And really uh, what people do all the time is molecular, first principles molecular dynamics, which is sort of an oxymoron. It's, they just move the atoms. They don't care about where the electrons are, but because we don't have models of how the atoms move independently of what the electrons do um, or, or without recourse to the electrons, uh, you use methods that are down here with capabilities of hundreds of atoms and picoseconds. And really you do simulations up here. You want to know where the atoms are. You would like to model thousands of atoms because that's what you care about. You don't care about what the electrons do, but you're forced to use methods that are far, far too expensive. And in fact, what we're trying to do here in this whole work is to take this first principles idea and extend it. So systematically derive these higher length scale models from the lower length scale models as they've been done throughout electronic structure theory, but now we want to leave the electrons behind. So that's the, that's the big picture and, and you know, maybe Further, I won't talk about that. Other people try to do that. It's it's uh, it's it's much harder. Just to show you that this is not a niche field. Uh, this is um, I'll show you the update in a second. But this is a ten-year-old uh, data set of how the UK National High Performance Computing, that's the civilian part of our computing infrastructure, how is it used? And the green part. So this is the green part of the pie, including this little sliver, and that's all running electronic structure calculations. And the red part, which is running molecular dynamics without recourse to electrons, is the, is the red part here. So you can see that 
uh, about 40% uh, of, of the computer time or in the UK civilian use was devoted to solving um, uh, the electronic structure uh, problem. And most of it is wasted in the sense that I mean, that most of these, almost all of this time, people didn't care about the wave functions of the electrons they were computing. They cared about where to move the atoms. So what I'm trying to do in this whole research program is to essentially either save all of this, essentially all of this computer time, but that's not how it works. The computer is already there. So we're going to use it to, instead of getting wasting it on electrons, being able to, all these people are going to be able to simulate much larger systems for much longer timescales because you ask the question in the right, on the right level. Um, the US is the same. So this is again, a couple of years old now. It's the, one of the largest civilian uh, computers um, uh, that NSF runs. Uh, and, and here the table is a bit different. Uh, it's sort of a histogram. And here you see most of the time, and this is a log scale on the Y. So a huge amount of time is used in molecular dynamics and a smaller but not insignificant amount of time used in this blue region in electronic structure. This, by the way, reflects uh, materials modeling um, traditions and capabilities of the US and the UK. So uh, the US, uh, in terms of where people write the codes and where the expertise is, um, much, much more so on the ND side, the US is big. People do, lots of people do everything, but the, the, the biggest ND codes are written in the US and in the UK by, by, by fraction, a lot of people are engaged in electronic structure um, rather than ND. This is just the update. So I, I downloaded this yesterday. Uh, last month, Archer 2 is the successor of the UK HPC, and I've used the same coloring. So you can see that still 35% uh, is actually a single code that does electronic structure calculation. And the other green bits uh, are added onto it. So again, 40% is electronic structure and a little bit uh, on 10%, uh, you know, 8% uh, molecular dynamics. So the thing that I'm talking about how to do molecular dynamics accurately and fast and with the right tools affects you know, half of all civilian uh, computer use uh, in the US and the UK. So uh, people have been doing molecular dynamics, just not systematically. So where, so we, which are the fields in which uh, this is done? So the uh, one big field is, is biomolecular simulations. So imagine uh, your, uh, he, here's a, a small organic molecule and you describe its bonds and angles and dihedrals, and you write simple functional forms for them. This is uh, sort of a, a, a 60 year uh, idea. And people have been doing this with a lot of uh, success in uh, modeling soft materials. One could argue that um, the, the Nobel prize given a couple of years ago, uh, ostensibly for QMMM, hybrid calculations, really it was given uh, because of biomolecular modeling in general on the atomic scale, uh, the, the QM quantum part of that was sort of smallish. Um, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is very big business. Um, it's not very accurate. So this is a plot of this small molecule uh, and these are uh, energies of its various uh, conformations. And we have um, the quantum energies here, the uh, empirical model energies here. And yes, there's a trend but this is, this is just really not that good. Um, there's another area where, uh, so, but, but these models are very, very transferable. So the idea here is that you fit this thing once with a few parameters and you then use them forever. Um, there's another area, which is uh, gas phase quantum chemistry, the, the up to 10 atoms, but mostly four, um, that where people do do, what I want to do on a large scale. They do it on a very small scale. They make the, the world's best quantum mechanical calculations for these very small systems of one water or two waters. And, and they des describe the potential energy surface of where they are, how the atoms move super accurately. Their problem is that their methods scale exponentially with the number of atoms. And, it just, and, and you, know, you, you, do, you do it for 12 atoms and that's a triumph. And then you do it for, uh, but, but, and what you can do is much less. You, you compute a single energy or something. Uh, so, so this really is, uh, it, it runs out of steam and it's, it's sort of not new. I mean, people have been doing this for 20 years uh, and, but the number of atoms they can treat goes up uh, very slow. Uh, when, you, when you do this well, 
um, it really works. So this is, uh, uh, I'm just showing you experimental and calculated spectra for water as derived from the modeling of one and two water molecules, but you can then play tricks and, and deduce the spectrum for bulk water. And this is exquisite accuracy uh, to be able to take extremely sensitive things. This is the infrared spectrum. This is the Raman spectrum, two different ways of, um, of, uh, of probing uh, the, uh, the vibrations uh, present in uh, and excitations present in water. And this is, uh, you, know, you, you, don't, you don't need to do anything better than this uh, in reproducing uh, the details of experiments. This is five, seven years old. Um, and then the third area is uh, sort of my home turf, where I started to do uh, when I was here at MIT as a graduate student, is uh, solid state materials. So the deformations, uh, phase changes, and defects of, of in the solid state of various materials. Here's a piece of diamond. And this tradition uh, uses sort of physics-based functional forms, that means guesswork, uh, sort of intuition, a few parameters, uh, not very systematic, um, and it can access large uh, length scales uh, and time scales, but, but it's really, um, it's not very predictive. It's, you, you, you get back what you put in, um, and, and it's not very accurate either. Uh, here's a, uh, an example of a bar chart for silicon. The, all these methods are different flavors of one of these things, and the bar charts are percent errors with respect to a good calculation of using quantum mechanics. So you can see these tens of percents, 50, some properties will be 100% error. Uh, and it's really not a choice of how you parameterize. If you choose different parameters, the bars will shift around, but you can't systematically lower them. So what we'd really like is to create, um, is to derive from quantum mechanics the potentials uh, that atoms feel uh, so that it's linear scaling. It doesn't scale exponentially like for the gas phase quantum mechanics methods. It's reactive like we have for materials and it's transferable like we have um, for, uh, uh, for molecules. So it, I want to show you um, without, without going too much into the detail of these models, just the the kind of thing that we were hoping for and the kind of revolution uh, that uh, when you achieve this, um, uh, that you can get. So this is tungsten and this is um, sort of two decades, 30 years of modeling tungsten empirically. And this was the state of affairs before 2010. So here are a bunch of properties, some elastic constants, vacancy energy, surface energy, and again, errors, percent errors with respect to DFT. And you see that, that 30 years of development hasn't made much difference. Now, that doesn't mean that those models shouldn't have been made and published. They were very carefully used to, for specific scientific purposes, make a new model, compute an observable that somehow that specific observable was better than before. You deduce something about the material. Good scientific work, but just if you think about the raw accuracy is this model reproducing quantum mechanics? Um, the answer is no, and no improvement really uh, with any of these. And then you come along with the techniques that I'm going to uh, tell you about, uh, machine learning methods, data-driven, many parameter fits, you learn how to do them, and you get this. And so that's the moment when you say, okay, we have something new. That's the, um, you know, that's the, the, the face recognition moment, right? The, the thing that machine learning did to vision is, is this for materials. It's an example of that. And, and right, controllable, convergible error as small as you want for arbitrary number of properties. And they don't, they don't fight each other. Get one property worse, the other property better. You can just all converge. So that's the goal for in, in general. How do, we, well, how do we do it? Um, we need some atomic descriptors. We don't want to deal with the electrons anymore. So we take the atoms and we say, look, you have some atoms around you. Those are the things that influence um, the forces and the energies uh, of, of an atom. So we need to describe those neighboring atoms in some way. And that's where the, that's the kernel of the breakthrough is how do we describe uh, the atoms? We need uh, to take account of symmetries. So if I rotate your environment, the force should rotate with that. If I permute two atoms in your environment in the list of neighbors, the forces and energies shouldn't change. 
uh, it turns out that that's simple to say, very hard to do in practice. Um, that was the mathematical breakthrough that enabled all of this. Once you have described your neighbors um, in some way, you can compare two neighborhoods, uh, then uh, you could do regression. So regression is a standard technique. You can do linear regression. Uh, we can do kernel regression. Um, and I won't go into the, uh, the sort of mathematical detail of that, but um, suffice to say that we do these things in high dimension. And that, although people have been doing regression for a very long time, how to do that in a very high dimension so that it doesn't overfit, that's where we pick up the, the traditions and, uh, and the new ideas from machine learning methods. Well, almost all machine learning methods are, well, no, half, machine, half of machine learning methods are regression. The other half is, is um, density estimation, right? Where you don't have labels. But where you have labels, you're doing regression. Uh, and, and we started out using Gaussian processes, neural networks, linear regression works also. Once you have that, then um, you get yourself some target function, atomic energies, forces, but could be something else. Could be um, uh, the chemical shifts on an atom, depending on its environment. Uh, so anything that one can compute quantum mechanically could be tensorial properties, like a polarizability uh, of an atom. Um, you put the electric field on it, and how much do the, do the charges shift around? Uh, that can be calculated. And all of these properties can be regressed. As, and, and be made modeled as a function of uh, the neighbor environment. So uh, what, uh, the, what this looks like in practice is that you choose uh, a, a, some version of the Schrodinger equation that, you're, uh, that you can solve depending on the size of your computer and the needs. So how accurately do you actually need it for, the, um, uh, for your application? And let's say that uh, you can do 100 atoms and it costs you a couple of hours in computer time. Then you generate a whole bunch of these uh, 100 atom samples that you do the quantum computation for. And that gives you essentially samples on the potential energy surface. For each, the, all the atoms are scrambled up. They're in a different configuration. And for each configuration, you have an energy and a set of forces. Um, and then you do your regression. So now you interpolate, essentially, these, uh, these points on the potential energy surface. Uh, and, and that model, that, in, that uh, uh, in, in, in our case, the Gaussian process model will run in a millisecond instead and linear scale with the number of atoms instead of taking hours and hours uh, for just 100 atoms. Now you compute the energies and forces, and maybe you compute observables that you're interested in. And in the first, uh, run, first time you do this, they may not be accurately enough because you haven't collected enough data. Um, and, but you can go back. So you go back, generate more data, how you do that, what how you make sure that, this, uh, that, your, that your data is relevant is, is the bread and butter of, of, of machine learning in some ways. Um, and you run around this circle uh, a couple of times uh, until you get the desired result. And we should worry, we do worry about the convergence of this, um, but at the moment uh, our, our experiences are all empirical. Uh, typically we run around this circle at most 10 times and things converge, uh, turn out that turns out that things converge really quite well. Uh, so this is, uh, what, well, this is what, what we started uh, about 10, 15 years ago. And by now, it has really changed uh, how molecular dynamics is done. Uh, lots and lots and lots of papers, lots of groups around the world have switched over to doing this. It has changed how we do uh, material simulation. So um, we take these descriptors, uh, we since then understood much more about the descriptors uh, than, uh, than when we started. Um, I'm going to tell you about a particular one, the smooth overlap of atomic positions. It's, it's easy to understand. I have a nice graphic for it, but there are many others. They essentially do the same thing. Um, and then uh, you, we do shallow learning. So this is not a deep learning where you have many, many, many layers of a neural network. This is shallow learning, two layers of a neural network or a Gaussian process. Those are actually equivalent. In some, uh, some, uh, in some limit. Um, and then uh, you generate potentials for real materials where you want to study uh, real uh, relevant problems. And we've done this for carbon, silicon, boron, phosphorus, iron. Um, boron and phosphorus have not had empirical potentials before. They are just too chemically weird. Uh, the, the, the competition between uh, three neighbors and five neighbors for boron is not something you can guess. Uh, and phosphorus is even worse. Um, and these are just elements uh, where, where, which are of scientific 
uh, academic interest, but uh, you, you might, uh, you won't be surprised to know that the moment you put elements together, there are materials questions uh, that, uh, that are unknown. Uh, and these are examples. Um, there's gallium oxide, uh, germanium antimony telluride is a phase change material, hafnium oxide, um, iron and sulfur at the Earth's core conditions, temperature and pressure is not something you can probe experimentally. So we can use uh, accurate molecular dynamics to determine uh, the, the um, phase segregation of sulfur, for example, in uh, solid and liquid iron. Uh, lithium uh, thiophosphate is a, is a, is a sol proposed solid state battery material, uh, which conducts lithium ions. But how exactly it does that and what the defects uh, do is, uh, you, you don't know, we don't know, and we have to use atomistic simulation. Um, other groups uh, use these techniques. So these are all just the things that we've done in my group. Um, here uh, is an example of, um, of, a, of a force field built with our techniques um, to uh, hybrid per, for hybrid perovskites. So those are solar cell materials and they go undergo various interesting phase changes. And in order to simulate those phase changes, we need larger unit cells, longer time scales, uh, which are outside the reach of, of the quantum mechanical methods, the explicit uh, electronic methods. So you fit a potential and study them. Um, here's something that's, that's even more surprising, um, iridium oxide is a catalyst. And of course, catalysts, heterogeneous catalysts uh, work by attracting molecules to the, to the surfaces where they undergo chemical reactions. So if you want to understand that, you better have an idea of what that surface looks like. So you take a crystal, you cut it, that's the surface. Um, well, that's if you don't know any better. But it turns out that with um, these machine learning potentials, you can try a huge number of different conformations. In fact, these guys did simulated annealing, so global optimization of the surface of this catalyst. And they've obtained structures, highly strained structures that nobody has ever seen before. Nobody knew that, that, that oxides can do this. So this, as a function of oxygen chemical potential, these structures become the stable um, uh, surfaces and they are not stoichiometric. It's not the, two oxygens for one iridium. Um, the, the, there are oxygens missing here because in the typical uh, conditions in which the catalysts are used, a reductive atmosphere, you don't have that much oxygen. And it turns out that, that sort of uncovered these, these completely new surfaces, which are now being studied um, both experimentally, so confirming uh, these discoveries um, with microscopy, but also now you bring your molecules together, do the quantum chemistry and and you find that uh, everything changes compared to the, to the as-cut uh, surface. Uh, here's a, a, an example again from my group, uh, just to show you uh, the sort of uh, delicacy and, uh, and what goes into the delicate details and what goes into building one of these uh, generic potentials. So here's carbon, material of interest to uh, many, many people. Uh, and uh, we've built a database which really includes all the forms of carbon that we could think of. So it has diamond, uh, amorphous carbon, graphite, uh, various sort of uh, low density structures, nanotubes, um, buckyballs, everything that we could find. Uh, and, and we did the potential to that. And what this image shows you is sort of in a two dimensional embedding, the density of our database. Um, uh, Right, so he, here's where most of our data is around diamond and amorphous carbon, and here's another set around these small fullerenes. Now, the challenge of calculating all of these things quantum mechanically is the, the quantum calculations are sort of straightforward, but the challenge of the fitting is is uh, is very large because the accuracy that you have to get these potential energies correct to with it, the accuracy with it in which you want this uh, potential energy. Uh, model is, is, is extreme. So we can think, understand that by thinking of two forms of carbon. So here's a carbon dimer, two carbon atoms, and I want to bring them together. And my model should know that carbon atoms repel if you pull them, put them close enough. And if you put them under one angstrom, then you know the energy goes up to 10 electron volts. And you want to describe that with some fidelity. If you go to graphite layers, a material you want to study, so you want your model to be accurate for it, then um, the, uh, you take graphite and you take two planes of graphite and they should move between each other and move away from each other with the right, um, uh, right interaction. But the energy of interaction of graphite is tiny. That's why it's soft. 
That's why you write with a pencil because the graphite layers come away very, very easily. So the per atom, the binding energy between two graphite layers is 0 0.03 EV. And you want to get it right. So the energy range and accuracy range here, dividing 10 by the accuracy that I want to reproduce the graphite curves with means that it's about four orders of magnitude. So I want to fit a function in a high dimension to an accuracy of one part in 10,000. That's tough, right? So think about what, what typical accuracy you want. Um, I mean, it's gonna sound funny, but it's, you, take, you, you make a graph and you take it to your advisor. Well, it's got a, the lines have a width. So how, what's the line width compared to the graph? A eh, hundred, one hundred, right? So in, in the relevant figure, once you've taken the logs and whatever, however you present it, your accuracy is one in a hundred. So I, I maintain that scientific accuracy is one in a hundred because our graphs look like that. So, so here, this is two orders of magnitude, uh, two orders of magnitude more. Um, and this one in a hundred is, you, 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 suppose you make a face recognition algorithm and you deploy it at the border. I, I've, I've come through several borders uh, security to come here. And it, it, it looks at you and identifies that same as the passport. When is that good? When can you save all the human labor and very, very boring human labor, um, very low quality jobs just looking at people? 99% uh, accuracy, one in a hundred is pretty good. Right? You need many fewer people. And if the algorithm is uncertain, then you route the person to the, you route the, the uh, co person coming through the border to somebody who then looks. But 99% accuracy in face recognition is, is great. It's better than humans. It's rubbish for materials. For the, in order to get graphite and diamond and, and, and this carbon carbon interaction, two orders of magnitude more. So this is, uh, this is extreme accuracy. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's fine. We can do it. We can do it with uh, something like a, li a linear fit with 9,000 basis functions, uh, 6,000 calculations of order about 100 atoms. So we can do it in a month uh, on a small cluster. Uh, and then you check all of these properties. Don't read, you can't read the details, but these are all various properties of carbon defect energies mostly. And um, the previous empirical models are the crosses and the target and our model are the the circles and the axis. So you get it right with some accuracy. This is, these are not the pointwise accuracy of the, of the energy surface. These are actual properties that you care about um, when you want to model carbon. Uh, here's another example, uh, which now actually does, uh, we, do a, we do a new science with this. So uh, we do the same thing for silicon. So we have a general model uh, that uh, with similar parameters to the carbon. Uh, and now we can ask, uh, first of all, we can study systems that we couldn't study before, amorphous silicon. What does it look like? What, what is the structure? There were no good models of amorphous silicon really because it's not a crystal. You can't model it with just a few atoms. The nearest neighbor structure, every silicon has more or less four neighbors that we knew that you can do, get, get from experiment. But what does it look like on the nanometer scale, on the 10 nanometer scale? There were really no good models of it. So using the, the machine learned model that's a million times faster than um, the electronic structure computation, we can make a 100,000 atom model of amorphous silicon, and then you would put it under pressure. So that's uh, what happens is the color is coordination. So fourfold coordinated to start with, you put it under pressure, you see the volume going down, uh, and then eventually you see what is known experimentally that you nucleate a new kind of crystal. So it's one of the few materials which if you, Put, take the amorphous, uh, most materials, crystals, you crush them, they become disordered. This is the other way around. It's disordered, you put it under pressure, it becomes a crystal. And here are snapshots from that movie. And we have the fourfold coordination here, the eightfold coordination of the new crystal that's nucleated. And it was known experimentally, what is the, the new um, crystal structure? But what you see is all this kind of yellowish white stuff. So that's high coordination. So it's a new phase of silicon that turns out that when you put it under pressure, it collapses to a very high coordinated phase, 10, 12 neighbors uh, for every silicon atom. And then slowly you nucleate this eight coordinated 
simple hexagonal phase. And this is the kind of thing that you can get from simulation. Uh, and then later on, you correlate it with other changes like electrical conductivity and so on that, uh, and, uh, that you can't get from experiment because this thing happens fast. And once you put, go into the lab and have these high pressures, you don't have the tools uh, to invest. There's no, you can't do microscopy essentially. So uh, here's an example, sort of even more uh, just broad brush on, uh, on doing similar things to molecules. So um, here's this, the, actually the same molecule I showed you before. And here's the same um, empirical model, which is not very good. And you, you put the machine learning model on, it says gaps, that's soap gaps. So Gaussian approximation, this is with the Gaussian process. Uh, and then you, this energy energy uh, correlation becomes much better. And you can go away and use it for something useful. So this, uh, it's, it, this is sort of a drug-like molecule. It's not an actual drug for anything, but it, it has these aromatic rings connected by a few flexible bonds. That's, a, that's a very quite typical of, uh, of what drugs look like. And then you can compute the interaction energy of this guy inside the pocket of a protein. And you have to jump through some hoops. So in fact, what you want is the free energy, not the energy. So you have to do a bit of sampling. And in fact, you want not the raw energy interaction energy between vacuum surrounding the molecule and the protein, but water surround, the difference between what happens when water is around it versus the protein. So there's this little thermodynamic cycle, um, but, but now, you, now we have an accurate model. So we can actually make a change to how, um, uh, people do these calculations, make them more accurate. Here's uh, uh, just another uh, another one. Uh, again, just uh, just an illustration. Uh, this is a catalysis problem. Uh, this is iridium. Uh, no, it's indium oxide in this case, which is a catalyst for carbon mono carbon hi uh, dioxide hydrogenation. That's what if you want to suck out carbon dioxide from somewhere, you want to don't want to store it as carbon dioxide. You want to turn it. Uh, into a, a fuel using energy. And this is a catalyst to do that. It will this reaction pathway turns carbon dioxide into methanol, which is a feedstock for, um, for, for all of chemical engineering. And uh, what, uh, we can make a model for this and study the reaction pathways. And this is actually a reaction pathway calculation of carbon dioxide turned into methanol. Now this was known and painstakingly discovered piece by piece using density functional theory, using electronic structure theory. But what we are showing here is that we have a reasonably automated procedure to generate the data, fit the potential, and then um, validate it and, and make sure that it does uh, what we actually know about this particular uh, reaction pathway. But this is all at, at low temperature. Uh, this idea of adding atoms one by one with nothing moving, that's a zero temperature idea. In reality, this happens at uh, 500 Kelvin, 600 Kelvin. So there are no studies of that uh, at that operating temperature. And it actually happens on the reduced environment. So some oxygens should be missing here. So that's the plan that once you have a fast model, you can then actually um, study uh, the things that people have not been able to study, even about reactions that you know. Um, I want to draw your attention to the uh, to two recent papers. These are uh, appeared in a um, uh, Chemical Reviews, which is a review journal. Each of these is 80 pages. Uh, and um, uh, please read them because we spent a lot of time writing them and making 45 uh, figures, half of which were original just for this review. And they really explain in rather great detail, but in, in some, um, uh, in, in, a, in a, what hopefully is a readable way, uh, how we do this new type of regression for materials and molecules. So that's where I'm just picking a few examples here, but this, this paper has a lot of application detail, how you build databases, how you validate them, what can you get from them? And this other paper uh, is on the descriptors themselves. So it's much more mathematical and it's about the, uh, the new mathematics that we've learned about how to express, how to describe environments of atoms, really point clouds of 50 points around the origin in a symmetric way where permutations and rotations uh, are accounted for. And that turns out to be very complicated. And so it, it is worth uh, its, own, uh, its own review paper. So uh, in the sort of last uh, uh, quarter of the talk, 
I just like to highlight a few challenges and what are we what are we thinking about now? Everything that I told you uh, is um, is sort of the past ten years, but what's uh, what's what's going on now? So one thing that is definitely uh, true, and any chemist uh, uh, could have would have told me had I bothered to ask them, uh, is that radicals are hard. So ground state closed shell molecules are much easier once you have radicals, which are not every reaction needs radicals. You can go from closed shell to closed shell, atom reaction takes place, the electrons do the right thing, and you end up with two closed shell molecules. But in many uh, instances, you'd like to be able to study radicals. And, and it turns out that fitting them, making potentials for radicals, which is not something that anybody's really tried before, but we can compute radicals with electronic structure theory, it's much, much, much harder. I'm not, at the moment, I'm not even sure it's possible. Something else that is would resonate with people who think about machine learning in general is that I want to make a force field that is not only very accurate where I've trained it, but it's also never silly. And that turns out to be hard, right? That's the extrapolation problem. That's the robustness problem of all high dimensional data driven machine learning models. The equivalent of this in vision is the changing of the 10 pixels and the dog turning into a cat, right? Reliably, the, the, the misclassification. And the equivalent of this here is, um, is that you go to some configuration, you push two atoms together or something, and the model fails to give you the sensible, even if inaccurate, but at least sensible answer that the energy of that should be high. And, and this is hard. And the problem is that it's not a, with molecular modeling, it's not a small problem that you can detect or somehow uh, do something else when that happens. It's absolutely catastrophic. If you take a big system, you run hot molecular dynamics. If there is a chance for the model to fail, to give you a erroneously low energy where it shouldn't, it will find it because you're running molecular dynamics. It will find the low energy structures. And if those are unphysical, your whole simulation will be thrown out. So this is a big, big problem. I'm very, I'd like mathematical guarantees that these machine learning models are not worse than the empirical models uh, that, uh, that are low, few parameters, and, but just not accurate enough. Um, there are other uh, sort of more mathematical problems here. Um, not only would I like a potential that is not a force field, that's not silly, I would really like to get control of accuracy. So how do you make sure that the accuracy is uniform? In what space? for the potential energy, for the forces, for the observables. So I think that's a, that's a vexing problem uh, and, and partly motivates my, uh, my trip here and, and, and talking to Yusef's group and, and other people who, who know about, um, uh, who, who are more on the applied math side. Uh, I won't talk about charge self consistency. That's the extension of all these two moving, moving charges. Um, let's see, uh, I, I guess I, I, I have five minutes left. Uh, let me think about what's, what would you benefit from most. Um, I have a couple of slides on the, on, on the descriptors themselves. Um, I'm going to skip them. Uh, I want to show you a few more examples, but now not of the successes, but of the, of the challenges. Let's go here. Uh, okay, that's cute, but we can skip it. Um, so here's, here's something that we are, we are currently working on that's really hard. Um, Organic liquids. So we have, I, saw, I mentioned the solid state battery electrolyte, but actually the batteries in all your phones are not solid state uh, batteries. Uh, they have electrolytes that are, um, that, that are in the liquid state. Um, and, and the challenge is to describe these very weak intermolecular interactions at the same time as describing the strong covalent interaction. And so if you just take these pair of molecules, the, uh, uh, these, uh, ethylene carbonate and ethyl methyl carbonate, uh, you uh, put them in a big box and you do the thing which we always do, run some MD, get the data, fit the model, uh, then, um, right? So that's, that's the idea that you run these very small systems and then you run uh, these very big systems. Uh, that's, you, that's how you validate, that's what you want to study. Um, then you want to, for example, reproduce the density as a function of ratio of EC and EMC molecules. That's one of the most basic things that the model um, should do. But when we do this, the following thing happens. Um, here's the dynamics with an empirical model. Uh, and you can see, okay, it's, it's, it flows, it's a liquid, 
uh, fine. Then you do this with a machine learning model and it does something kind of stupid, but it's the molecules don't break up, but it kind of swells and you get these large, um, these, these bl blue clouds are kind of gaps where there are no molecules and just always does that. And that's because the intermolecular interactions are so weak that we don't describe them accurately enough to hold the material together. And since this was made, now we've seen the same thing in every other project where we try to sort of do this directly. So it happens for water, it happens for sulfur. Sulfur is made of S rings of eight sulfur molecules, which then weakly interact with one another. So this is sort of a big problem and we have ad hoc solutions. So in this case, we stabilize this by taking snapshots and just expanding them uniformly and putting that into the training set. It works in the sense that we don't get this swelling anymore, but we have no idea why that works. It shouldn't really. There's no mathematical reason because previously we had low density structures as well. So I, it's not clear what this thing adds um, that wasn't there before. We don't understand it. Um, there are uh, really new exciting developments. Uh, I, uh, of course, the moment you do machine learning with anything, there'll be 10 people doing the same thing with neural networks, just because it's, it's, it's cool, it's fashionable. Um, and for 10 years, I've resisted that because the neural network models for potentials were rubbish. Really, like utterly crap, 10 times, 100 times worse than what you could do with, um, with uh, Gaussian process regression until 2021. The late 2021, there's a model, uh, NetCrypt, which is based on a package called E3NN that's developed by Tess Schmidt, is now at MIT. Not in, I think, probably not in um, a small uh, way because of the success of that, uh, which is really good. Like, I can't, I've been very happily ignoring neural networks. This is massive passing networks. They're complete rubbish except NetWeek is really good and it kind of beats our best models. So we really need to understand it. Uh, and, um, and so we are doing neural networks and, um, and we will hopefully understand which aspect of these message passing equivariant neural networks are actually necessary. Um, I'm, I'm not ready to talk about it, but we've thrown out half the, the tricks of the, of the deep learners and it's still very good. Um, so uh, so that's, that's, that's really exciting. Um, there are linear models, uh, which are also better than our original Gaussian process models. These are sort of generalizations of our original descriptors. Um, again, uh, I don't want to bore you with the details, but just to show, and the only reason I brought this up is to, this is the only time when I actually caught a number for how fast these potentials are. So these are, these are our first set of models, everything that I've shown you uh, evolves with this, but now with these linear high body order, linear regression models, that's the blue line. So the more larger the base is, the better the accuracy. Oh, and, uh, and we get two orders of magnitude of speed over the old Gaussian process modeling, partly due to just much better coding, but also uh, due to a better understanding of those descriptors. And so we get to this 0.1 to one milliseconds per atom. And that's the regime that all of these models are in. So empirical models, super fast, but inaccurate models are microsecond. This is um, sort of a hundred times slower, but controllable quantum accurate. And then the electronic structure would be sort of over here on the log scale, right? So it's a the huge improvement, of course, not as fast as, as a simple empirical model. Let me skip that. And I want to sort of finish with this uh, idea that, um, can I get rid of this guy? What do I do? More, oh, hello, so X, X, thank you. Um, so there are, now that in the grand scheme of things, for the first time, we have controllable accuracy models that can approach the true potential energy surface. Suddenly, a new kind of question occupies our mind. And it's basically, uncertainty quantification, UQ, applied to atomistic modeling. It just wasn't applied before because we couldn't approach, we couldn't control our errors. So there's a forward problem, which is given a database of the small structures that we can do the quantum calculations for, how does the accuracy of the fit point-wise um, determine the accuracy of a property that you want to compute? The melting point, the surface energy, the vacancy formation energy, all the things that I, uh, that I showed in the examples. Nobody knows that. 
that kind of sensitivity question is unknown because people didn't have models that could be conversed. Um, so that's, that's the forward problem, um, going from the errors and the database to the properties. This is a deletheation energy of, a, of, of the solid state battery. But then there, of course, is the inverse problem. So really, I want, I start out by saying I have a material and I know that a property that I'd like to simulate and I don't have a model at the moment, I'm gonna make one. So what should I put in it? What should go into the fitting database? And what weights should I target my fitting energies and forces, the fitting properties with, so that I minimize the error in my actual scientifically interesting property. And that's, that's much harder, of course. And typically, of course, they are very, these problems are very related. People solve inverse problems by solving forward problems many times. Um, but so you, you sort of need both. Um, what's happening in the next five years? Uh, I think there will be, um, materials are a bit ahead of molecules. Molecules, the, the molecular models were better. So it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a tougher job to improve on them. But I think there will be uh, a machine learned organic force field uh, that is in some important sense better than what we, more accurate than what we had before. Um, also, we, we are developing, and lots of other people are developing new workflows, new ways of doing simulation. Uh, so, uh, and, and here's the system, here's your question. Maybe not press one button, but write a short script uh, and it will make you a model for complex materials that will allow you to simulate stuff. And we're working on batteries, with perovskites, catalysis, uh, and so on. Um, and again, something that I didn't, I'm not quite ready to talk about, but, but, but people are beginning to think about how to use the same tools, the same ideas uh, for, instead of regression, to do generative modeling. Let's create materials. Let's create uh, new molecules using the, the, the idea of, uh, of property fitting. And I want to just leave you with, uh, with, a, with a bold prediction that ab initio MD, so first principles molecular dynamics, which is, was the oxymoron, uh, and it has very, very expensive, but it has changed uh, how we do atomistic modeling over 40 years and had huge success, I think is dead. It will be replaced by this kind of uh, machine learned molecular dynamics, which coarse grains the electrons away in a systematic way once you have good control of the errors and you have the workflows. So thanks very much. I've uh, spoken for about 50 minutes. Questions? We have uh, plenty of time for questions. Uh, there's a couple of questions online in the chat, but maybe we'll start with the room. And just to make it online, I'm gonna... Thank you, very interesting talk. So I'm wondering, uh, here is the machine learning for these new potentials, all the things coming through the data, right? In the empirical, through the... come from the data, from the training point, training data. Okay, it turns out, yeah. So in the empirical potential, we use a lot of physics inspired formula. Mm -hmm. So is there a way kind of combine those two to solve some problem like you mentioned, uh, if for the machine learning one, if you, you do some exploitation, if the data is yeah, covered yeah, there, the yeah. error is horrible. So, so I think some of that is, is being done, but, but in a very small way. So for example, I, I kept mentioning this problem of, of atoms coming together. Uh, and, and the energy is very high, but you don't really care how high in most applications. And that's a piece of physics that I want to put in. I don't want to learn, have to fit that or learn that because atoms can come together in many different ways. And if I have an environment of 30 atoms, you can imagine it's a high dimensional space, but anytime any of those two atoms come together, the energy is high. And I don't care what the other atoms. Are. So that's a problem. That's a thing that we are solving in, in similar ways, in, in putting in empirical functional forms for the pair interaction. And that's, so that's one example, but it's, um, it's not, uh, well, it is systematic, but it's a low, very low dimensional example. So the question is, is what do you really know? When you have an empirical model, let's say you take a, an embedded atom model, which is an empirical model. It says that, uh, that atoms have some electron density around them and electrons, uh, when they feel that electron density in some average way, then uh, uh, there is a, a, 
sort of an embedding function that an electron wants some electron density, but not too much. And that's an empirical thing. Um, how do you, is that, if you write that down mathematically, that's equivalent to a three body function. If you take that embedding function to be quadratic. So when I, I want, but it's not accurate enough. So I now want to free up the functional form. It's sort of not clear what remains of, the, for example, that idea. You might say, well, actually, the idea is that when there's very low electron density, the energy should go up in some way. When there's very high electron density, the, elect the energy should go up in some way. But, but it's hard to make that, um, again, many, many body. So I think that's the issue, that as long as you're dealing with low dimensional um, coordinates, pair interaction, three body interaction of how, how much electron density is around you. Yeah, those are the empirical formulas, but we are sort of going beyond them by making things many body and there aren't many body intuitions. Um, there's another thing that you, you said mentioned empirical potentials, but one could ask experiment. So why do, how can we bring in experimental data? Which is sort of where the intuitions originally came from. And that's very hard, right? Because the experimental data is is, is very usually very aggregate. It's what, what is experimental data? A, a, a PDF, a, a pair distribution function. So that's an extremely complex property. It sort of comes back to the UQ a little bit. If I understood how my potential energy surface influenced a complex property like a pair distribution function, then maybe if I measure the pair distribution function, I could then somehow go back. So I think there is, but nobody, I don't know anyone who's really doing that. Um, there are, um, what else could you do? Um, you could, uh, it's, it's be, because we go from below, we use experiment as validation. So I think this is a very interesting point, but, but I'm not sure, very few people are, are, are working on that. Uh, and, and even how one would, would do that is, is not clear to me, but it's a, it's, it's a very good question. And, and it does fit into this other, Sort of hobby horse of mine is that we shouldn't by doing machine learning we should not pretend to be stupid like one of the big problems of, of machine learning research is that you throw away what you knew and then you do machine learning and then you're so happy when you discover that the wheel is round i mean that that's a big problem and you know people i spend that serious time with talking to don't make that mistake but but we should take that very seriously if 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 you knew the quality of description of a, of, of a material should not go down. And that, and that sort of unfortunately comes down to what you're saying. Experimental and empirical knowledge, how can we build on it rather than throw it away? Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I'm curious for getting your ground truths for like large sets of data, uh, because some of the systems might be correlated or there may be method uncertainty in terms of mm. getting a ground truth, how you make your choice uh, mm. for simulation methodology. You mean to get which, which ground truth, which so, approximation of the ground truth do I use? Or? So I'm, yeah, exactly. Like uh, so, so that there's a huge amount of experience in materials modeling on what level of quantum mechanics is, is good enough for what, but there might be surprises because there will be properties which, um, let's take density functional theory. You can do hundred atoms in an hour on a CPU and an energy. Okay, that gives you some boundaries on what you can and cannot do. Is that good enough for phase diagrams, melting points? And well, for some materials at zero temperature or zero pressure, it's known, but actually ab initio phase diagrams are not tractable right now with the just density functional theory. So, Doing ML acceleration is the way to answer that question. Because now I can take a certain version of density functional theory and ask, fit a model. With that, I can compute the phase diagram because I'm a million times faster. So now I've learned whether that level of electron structure is good enough. And there, are, and there, are, there will be surprises. There'll be things where we thought this was good, but it's not good. I'll give you an example. Um, water is fantastically studied in fantastic detail, right? It's the water is the physicist's biology or something, right? So, it's, it's, so that's how every paper starts. Water is life. So then we go study a water molecule. But uh, 
so, okay, so there are immense number of studies on water and, uh, and it's always a benchmark for quantum chemistry. And uh, there are two ways of, two ways of doing calculations on moderately large water clusters. Um, traditional quantum chemistry with, um, uh, with a basis set and coupled cluster theory, and that's that whole sequence of correlated wave function quantum chemistry, or quantum Monte Carlo is a completely different method, uses different basis sets, and they're both solving in a controllable way the uh, full many body Schrodinger equation. Do they agree? So, well, um, this is, I think people are now less sure than before. And that's because they agree to within some accuracy and that accuracy is, as far as I can make out is about 10 milliEV per atom, which is good for lots of things, especially if you only do quantum chemistry, then you have cancellation of error, you compute energy differences, but for absolute terms, 10 milliEV per atom is not that good. We fitted a model to coupled cluster data and it didn't, didn't agree with Monte Carlo. And the larger the cluster, the worse the agreement. And so there are some gremlins here and skeletons in various chemistry department closets that are just really not, haven't come out yet. And I think this, by, by doing these sort of accelerations is one way to, to really tr try to understand it. And, and this is, I'm not a quantum chemist, so I, I, I can slag them off as much as I want. But, uh, but it's, it was amazing. I used those methods, and it's amazing to read books and these articles that quantum chemistry solves the Schrodinger equation. And then you corner the guy in the conference and say, look, tell me honestly, I'm never going to repeat it, especially with names. How many, what's the error of your method? Can you get to better than 10 milliV per atom on water? And then, well, it depends. Come on, what's the error? It's hard. They would say, oh, that's very hard. And, and for materials, certainly, to get good properties, and this is part of the sensitivity, we know that we need milliEV per atom accuracy to get good densities, to get good vibrational properties. So that's a problem when you can't, when, when actually your quantum methods need to be pushed. And one of the, one of the outcomes of this is that there's the high throughput calculations of these methods and, and people are now willing to do. Who before did 10,000 calculations of 12 waters in various arrangements? That, that's not useful other than for fitting. So now calculations are being done, which weren't done before, because that's a huge amount of computer time. That now we can use it for fitting and therefore people are doing these calculations and therefore we are starting to see the differences in these various quantum methods that people weren't seeing before. I think we're actually out of time. The, 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 yeah, thanks for the questions and discussion, and thanks for a really fantastic talk, thank Evora, And let's uh, all thank our speaker again. Thank you. Oh, I can answer them. Yeah. I can answer them.